All right, what's up, everybody? Thank you so much for jumping on to today's session with Todd McLean, Craig Wiggins, and myself, Joseph Puckett, on helping you prepare to make 2022 an amazing year. We covered a lot of information on Tuesday around hiring, developing your staff, creating compensation plans, holding your staff accountable to things that you're trying to accomplish today. And by the way, the recordings will be posted on our website by tomorrow, and I'll send the link out to everybody so if you missed Tuesday, have no fear. We've got the recording. <coughs> this recording will also be on that same website as well. So if you have to jump off, grab a call or something, no worries. But do try to pay attention and take a ton of notes because we have a lot of information that we want to share. Before we dive into the actual content, I need to actually share my PowerPoint that I thought I was already sharing. So now you can see my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Welcome to day two. Before we dive in to help you making 2022 an amazing year, taking advantage of everything that you have available with you and your carrier, I do want to mention a special offer to thank you for attending either Tuesday and or today's session to learn and grow with us. We're giving all this content away for free to help you and your agency. We'd love to work more closely with you via our CWC on-demand virtual training platform, which has over 1,200 training videos, over 100 documents and processes, including sales scripts, service scripts, marketing guides, handbooks, compensation plans. I could go on and on. We also do live training every single week, including role play with volunteers and staff from all across the country, all included for less than $6 a day. It's only $177 a month to be in our on-demand program with no contracts, no commitments, try it out. Try, you know what, you can try it out for $20. It's literally $20 and 22 cents to help us get ready for, help you get ready for 2022. Use promo code 2022 success at craigwigginscoaching.com slash on demand. We'd love to work with you and your team. Now, that's it, that's the pitch. Let's learn, let's grow. Today is all about lead generation. Definitely, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about how to generate business for you and your team because Look, we can teach you the sales process and teach you exactly what to say and how to say it, but you got to have people, you know, that you're going to be talking to for that to work. So before we get into, you know, all the paid stuff, all the things that people want to know about when it comes to live transfers and direct mail and that type of thing, I really want to take a little bit of time and talk about doing more with what you already have. So regardless of how long you've been in the business, you know, you've got something there to work with, right? You've got a book, you've got old quotes, you've got maybe some winbacks. And you really need to make sure you're doing a really good job with that stuff before you go out and start investing thousands of dollars in other programs, um, because this is all the low hanging fruit. You know, when we work with an agency. It's always really interesting to see how many inbound phone calls are coming in for service work where nothing is really being done with those inbound calls other than taking care of the transaction. There's a lot of low hanging fruit there with people that already know you. They've got a relationship with you. And they set aside time, you know, to talk about you, whatever it is they're dealing with. And they're probably set more time aside than what it's going to take to, to take care of the transaction. So we need to leverage that. So requotes and winbacks, those are givens. Cross sales, this is probably the biggest way, you know, to drive business in a, an immediate way. And most people are just not giving a lot of consideration. So when someone calls in, and this is kind of just really in a nutshell, what we teach people, when someone calls in, you should always be looking for what is that other line that they don't have? And instead of leading with a discount, which comes off very salesy, you want to do a mini review on whatever it is they have today. So Joseph calls in. He wants to change the mortgagee clause on his homeowner's policy. I see that he doesn't have auto. I take care of the mortgagee clause. All right, Joseph, we'll take care of that. We're going to send a copy to the mortgage company. You're also going to get a copy. By the way, while I have you on the phone, you know, there's been a lot of storms recently. A lot of people have had a lot of claims. I want to make sure you have what you need and that you understand it. So let's just take a couple of minutes and I just go right into it. Start with the dwelling, then the personal property, all the different things. And I'm looking for areas where I can give him some advice, where I can give some recommendations, okay? What I'm doing is not only am I reviewing and building that relationship with him on the existing policy, I'm earning the right later on to talk about the one he doesn't have. So I'm gonna leave the discounts for last during that mini review. And then the very last one is obviously the one where he's missing the discount for his auto. And I'm gonna say, Hey, Joseph, I see you don't have your cars insured with us. What kind of cars do you have? And I ask it just like that. Now, if I do that mini review, if I set it up that way, you know, with a compelling reason to do the review, because if you don't do that, if you just ask, 
hey, you want to do a review on your, on your, they're not going to do it. Nobody wants to do that. So I've got to give a compelling reason. We've had a lot of claims, we've had a lot of storms. Let's make sure you have what you need and that you understand it. And I do a good job with that review, that five, six, seven, eight minutes, wherever it takes me to do it. When I get to the end and I ask that question, what kind of cars do you have? He's going to tell me. And, and hopefully I've done a good job of coming off as an advisor, you know, as a consultant and not just a salesperson. You know, when I get to the end of that call and I gather information and then we go through the quote and we'll talk about the sales process um, a little bit later. But this is an area, you know, I don't care how big your book is, how long you've been in business. You have people that are monoline. You have people that they need other lines. Um, and really, you should be spending a lot of time trying to bundle your book anyways. You need you need more lines per household. Right. Make sure your team or make sure they're doing this. Hold them accountable to this process you know, on anything that's coming in inbound. And the same thing for the outbound. You want to talk about that for just a few minutes, Joseph? Yes. So everybody on the team, whether they're a sales person, whether they're a customer service representative, a marketer within your agency, you, everybody on the team needs to understand something. This is a sales organization. I love that we have customer service agents and we like to specialize staff. I think that's really important. If I had a basketball team with LeBron James on it, would I, want, would I necessarily want LeBron selling tickets or selling popcorn or do I want him on the court shooting threes, right? So I, I agree that specialization is really, really important, but everybody needs to understand that service is sales sales is service. So if you have dedicated customer service representatives who take great pride in the level of service that they provide because they give service with a smile, because they're nice, fast, friendly, efficient, that's great. That's good, but that's not good service. Our role when I'm explaining this to candidates that I'm interviewing, our current team members now, teams that we're training all across the country, our role is pretty simple. It can be summarized in like a sentence. Our job is to put ourselves in position to help our customers when they need us. How can we do that if we don't have their home, their cars, their umbrella, their life, their toys, anything else that you can offer at your agency to meet their needs? So on inbound service interactions, I hope that you have a great, nice, friendly service team who answers the phone politely. Y'all would be surprised. I call agencies all across the country, some in our program, mm -hmm. some in our program. Uh, hey, hey, thanks for calling. Thanks for calling. I hate my life right now. What's up with you? And I'm like, hi, this is Joseph Puckett. And what's interesting is when they know me, they perk up, they cheer up. Oh, hey, Joseph, good to talk to you. Yeah, you're here to call in for the owner, or whatever. How they answer calls, how they take care of your customers. It must be nice, polite, friendly, energetic, and all that. But their job is not just to give service with a smile. It's to turn those inbound customer interactions and lead with those mini reviews assume the quote of the other line and either quote it and write it themselves or pass it off to another sales team member to take that ball and run with it. But inbound and outbound cross sales crucial on win backs and requotes. We, excuse me. I don't know why I'm getting so choked up. Y'all I'm getting emotional over here, I'm getting <laughs> emotional on win backs and requotes and really your entire lead database. I wanted to mention briefly the importance of a lead management system and nurturing leads. Yesterday's live training for CWC member agencies only, I was teaching on prospecting timelines, how to leave voicemails, the frequency of contacts. It was a really powerful training session that we had, I don't know, six, 700 of our, of our agent participants on. Fantastic training systems, but I want to hit just a couple of quick points. You are crazy if you're allowing your staff to work leads on sticky notes or using a notebook or a CRM that's not really a lead management system that doesn't nurture leads, time leads, when we should be following up. There's some fantastic ones out there. For those of you with Allstate, Allstate Lead Manager is kind of you know, important and, and I think really uh, something that's coming for us all to utilize. Uh, there's other programs out there like Agency MVP. Dot com is fantastic and it has a lot of smart technology behind it. Ricochet and others are out there as well. Whatever lead management system you're using though, guys, you got to use it. Your staff have to use it. And nurturing your requotes, your win backs, and even your current customers to cross sell, it will dramatically, dramatically impact your business. And when it comes to how much, how much should we work a lead? Well, you know, what is the objective when you're working a list? Let's say you give one of your team members a list of 50 win backs on Monday, and they come and tell you on Thursday that they're done with that list. 
Are they done with that list, Todd? Do you want to chime in? Are they done with that list? Absolutely not. And <laughs> you know, so, something that I, I wanted to throw in real quick that actually helped me not only boost my retention, but helped me boost my winbacks and my service team was I noticed through listening to some calls that we weren't actually building relationships and learning about the household. Like we were just transactional, we were cross-selling, but we weren't learning about kids, right? Like we weren't learning, like the more you engage and feel friendly and personable, as long as you're using your lead management system wisely and, and entering in all those details, when you call that person back for a win back, you can say, hey, how, how's little Susie? Or, you know, you can really be more personable with someone and it's easier to win them back on that relationship. It's also um, harder to lose them because they feel more like your friend family kind of thing. Yeah, building rapport, getting to know your customers. Honestly, how can we make recommendations to meet our customers' needs if we don't even know what they do for a living? or how old their kids are, what their kids' names are, what their plans are for the future. Mark Mercer is one of our coaches here at Craig Wiggins Coaching. We did a uh, live training session back in October on building rapport, and he has a really fantastic method. It's called the Ford Method, Family, Occupation, Recreation, and Dreams. If we can find just a couple things of those of that acronym Ford, Family, occupation, recreation, and dreams, it will then make it a lot more relatable when we're telling them why they need certain limits, why they need certain coverages. So wonderful, wonderful point in your lead management system, take good notes, leverage your technology, automate things, right? The power of automating emails, reminders to call, all of those things is really, really crucial. So that list of 50, if they tell me on Thursday they're done, I'm like, no, you're not. There's no way you've quoted all 50. We have a sales philosophy here, kind of, kind of a phrase that we say here, buy or die. We're going to literally keep working with a prospect until they buy from us or they stop breathing. Or third option, <laughs> if they opt out, right? We want to be compliant. So if somebody says, stop calling me, bro, we need to opt them out of our system. But persistence pays is a phrase that I say all the time that we teach all the time. Your staff must be more persistent. They must be more persistent as they're working through their leads and lists. And you do that more consistently at a high level, your numbers will skyrocket. And as time goes on, maybe you don't have to do as much paid leads, which we're about to start talking about in a few minutes, because you're reworking things that have already been in the book. But before we do, you know, what Todd just said a minute ago about, you know, building rapport and developing that relationship, not only is that important when you're trying to sell the deal, right? When you're trying to give reasons why they need to move forward with your recommendations, it's critical when you're following up. So many people follow up where it's just all about, you know, the policies, you know, the quotes. And you really need to try to teach your team to follow up with something of value that relates to the people that, you know, that are in their family, that they're important to them. So make sure that you're doing that. Make sure that that's, that's part of your process. And it's not just transactional. Anybody can type information into a system and spit out quotes and, and then hope it's less. You know, what we try to teach them to do is to, to really understand that person so that they can take the information or learning about that person, and their family, tell a story that's relatable to that, where that person can actually see that picture being played out. And then hopefully that helps them close that deal. But if they don't, when they follow back up, just like Todd's talking about, now when I follow up, I can follow up with something where I'm, I'm leading more of that conversation that was extended from what we learned about when we were building rapport and not necessarily just the quotes. And that can make a huge difference for you. Well, you yes. mentioned, you know, on the slide here, it says persistence pays. 57% of all of my new business sales come after the 12th attempt. Wow. 12th. 12th. So what I've found, especially, you know, helping thousands of agents through lead management and follow-up, I found that it only takes about three or four before somebody gives up. Mm -hmm. that's, that's your average. And then what they do is they put it on automation and hope that it trickles in at some point versus making 12 call attempts, right? So it's, it's really important that you, you realize you don't give up, right? We're in a sales business. You paid for that lead. If you, if you try, automation is extremely important to keep engaging with people, but if you do not put in that human element, that human touch, you're, you're missing out on a whole lot of conversion. And guys, just, just like being really transparent with you, there's so many things you can go out there and invest money in. There's so many things you can look at as a shortcut to get where you want to go by buying things. 
when a lot of times it's just you need to spend more time with your team teaching mm -hmm. them skills that they'll carry the rest of their career right so you know if i could teach somebody to talk with somebody in a way where they're gathering information from them and like what todd just said you know 12 action items before they're able to actually sell the deal but those action items include more and more about their family and not necessarily about the quotes that they're following up on that can be the difference between somebody having a very successful month a very successful career or just kind of going through the motions so don't be tempted to just you know buy into things hoping for a quick fix because you pulled your credit card out when a lot of this is just work it's just actually working with your team teaching them things they need to learn to get better the good thing about that is the more and more you do the, the, the longer that lasts right once i start teaching somebody some skills and they demonstrate the ability to execute on that they're going to keep that for the rest of their career and it's going to make a huge difference later on down the road and Jeremy, excuse me, James just asked a question. Do you call multiple times a day, especially with getting a voicemail? It's like he's cheating, y'all. He was looking at my slides. <laughs> the very next slide is our voicemail scripts. This is a screenshot of one of our 27 pages of scripts. In addition to our sales scorecards, which is our whole sales process and service scorecard, which is our whole service process. But the idea of leaving voicemails is really, really important. <laughs> and this is kind of a, just a, a snapshot of the first voicemail as we're trying to work these various different types of leads. But James, it really depends on the lead source, right? If it's a new internet lead, you're hitting them a couple of times the first day and then every day of the first week, then maybe three or four times the next week, two or three times the week after that, then once or twice a week for the next month. And then maybe you let it hold off for a little bit. Then you ramp it back up again, right? But if I'm calling a cross sell, I'm not calling them two times in the first day, every day. I'm not going to pester an existing customer. And that's exactly what I trained on yesterday for our members is the timeline of all of the, the follow-up on the various lead types. But leaving voicemails, I think, is very, very important. Double tapping, double tapping. That's where you call somebody. Don't leave a message. Wait 30 seconds. Call back. When you call them again, they think this is important, right? If they don't answer the second time, leaving a voicemail is totally fine. Putting them into your lead management system, nurturing them even further. But this is another great strategy that works. Now, how about something as crazy and as antiquated? Oh, I'm sorry, Todd. Yeah, I want to add to the double tap. Um, so we definitely do the double tap. Something that you can, a lot of people are hesitant about doing that because they, they feel like somebody's going to get pissed when they answer the phone. What we say when they answer the phone is, Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I forgot to left, leave you a voicemail while I got you on the phone. That's our that's our script to like disarm people. I like that. Good tip. Yeah, very, very good, good tip. tip. That's a great tip. Um, how about something as antiquated as a handwritten card? Right, <laughs> y'all. These work. These work. If I'm working with a really great prospect, now mm -hmm. I'm not sending. I'm not asking my producer or my marketer or team member. To, to spend two or three minutes right now to handwritten card to someone that has a really poor insurance score, their credit's high, they have a lot of tickets and accidents, they might be single, non-homeowner, one car, 22 years old, they're not getting a handwritten card. But if they're married, homeowner, mm -hmm. multiple cars, we've quoted them in the past or had them in the past and they have great credit, clean records, a handwritten card sprinkled in with phone calls, with emails, with text messages sent compliantly, all right, we have to be compliant with, with texting and phone calls. Handwritten cards are powerful. So here's just a little picture of some examples that, that you and your staff can utilize. It can break through way, the way nobody else has. You think their current carrier, especially if they're with the Lizard or Flow, you think they're getting handwritten cards from them, right? Or maybe they're with another captive agency down the road and have been for a while. They haven't talked to them in years. You're trying to follow up with somebody via phone calls, emails, texts sent completely, and then sprinkle in a handwritten card, your contact rate will go through the roof. So that's just another strategy. We already talked about the importance of working your paid, excuse me, your prior leads from requotes, winbacks, cross sales, et cetera. Let's talk about generating some additional ones, customer referrals. Yeah. Yeah. This is another big way, again, without having to spend any money. Um, or additional money uh, above and beyond what you're spending right now to, to drive new business. And, you know, I think the old fashioned way of just, you know, who do you know? Can you give me three names? All those kind of things. 
they sound really good and you can role play them with your team and, and they'll do it. And, and it, it, it all goes the way it's supposed to go until it's time to talk to the customer mm. because they, they feel like they don't want to get rejected. They don't want to screw the deal up, whatever. And they just don't do it. So we teach them a very basic line that anybody can use towards the end of that conversation where they, they just finished up the deal. You know, so I just wrote Joseph's car, his home, his, his umbrella, and we're finishing all that up and finalizing it. And at the very end, I would just say something like this. By the way, Joseph, just curious, do you have any family in town? And just let him respond. Most referrals are family or friends, right? If I ask him if he's got any family in town, sometimes if I do a really good job, he may just go ahead and tee it up. He say, you know, my dad lives here. You really need to talk to him. You need, you need to talk to him about his insurance because he probably has some of the same questions that I have. But if he says, you know, my, my dad lives here, what I can then say, and this is what I would recommend that you teach your people, is take the word referral out when they're talking to the customer and use the word introduce or introduction instead. Because referral, recommendation, you know, those imply that everything is going to be at a, at a high level. You're guaranteeing some sort of assurance with that deal. Whereas with the, the introduction or introduce somebody, it's a little bit more neutral, right? So if I just say, hey, Joseph, I, I love an introduction to your dad. Would you mind introducing me to your dad? Okay. He says, yeah, it's great. Well, I tell you what, do me a favor and send him a text. Let him know I'll be calling him to talk to him about his insurance, just like we talked today, right? That one little line at the very end of that conversation, when you're wrapping up a deal, that can make or break someone's month. You know, we literally, we had someone that wrote 27 items off one mm -hmm. policy, 27 additional items from one policy because of all the referrals that she got in that given month. And it ended up making it, making a huge month for her, right? So this is, this is something that you can teach your team that requires some accountability, that requires some training, some role-playing. You know, you got to take it serious. But if you, if you don't do this and you're, you're leaving a ton of business on the, on the table that someone else, could, that they could be writing if they just took this extra step. So make sure you participate in this. Yeah, and your customers are trusting you and your team with their hard-earned money to protect what they the what they care about, their home, their cars, their lives, their families. Don't don't be ashamed to ask for referrals, but it will take practice. You're going to have to practice this with your staff because it can be kind of uncomfortable. Practice makes permanent. That's why we teach so much the power of role play, the power of coaching your team, et cetera. Tons of opportunities, though, with your existing book. How about outside the book, developing your own referral partners? Yeah, look, this, you know, there's so many things going on today with, you know, telephone and text and, and the inability to reach people, right? It's so it's getting more and more and more difficult than it was even just a few years ago. One area where you can kind of insulate yourself with, with proven, you know, a referral source or, or a lead generation source rather is working with COI, centers of influence, people that refer business to you. And it takes some work. It's back end loaded, meaning that it, it takes some time on the front end before you really see any results on the back end but you insulate yourself from all that stuff, right? All the legislation, all the rules, because if I work with a mortgage officer or a processor and they refer somebody over to me, my close rate with those people is going to be really high. And I don't have to worry about all the other things that are going on. I'm not having to worry about outbound phone calls. It's just a, it's a much easier route, you know, to grow your business. I started that way years ago, grew from, from scratch to around $10 million, mainly working with COIs before we bought any, there was no, internet leads back then. It was very limited in what you could buy anyways, but that's the way we had to grow. And to, and to this day, we still have a lot of those people that we work with. And the key to that, everybody wants to know, how do you, how do you make that work? The key to it is becoming friends with them. You've got to develop a relationship with that person where they want to refer to you. And there's a lot of gimmicks and a lot of programs and a lot of things to kind of help you get your foot in the door. And if that helps you, that's fine. But at the end of the day, You've got to set yourself apart as somebody who's a resource to them for insurance, who's helping them close deals, and ultimately is their friend. If I become friends with them and I get their own insurance and I'm doing a really good job when I follow up and I'm following up on time and I'm, and I'm providing advice and help in other areas, maybe outside of the homeowner's insurance, you know, to help them with other, other things that come up from time to time, I'm going to get a lot of referrals from that person. You know, and some people are going to, they're going to vary. Some are going to refer two, three, four a month. Some might refer 10 or 15 a month. You get a handful of people like that and you make that a priority where you've got a consistent process where you're going out and meeting with these people, whether you're doing meetings or individual lunches, whatever it may be, over time, that will pr produce 
huge dividends for you. And most people just quit before they see the results. It just takes time to, to make that work. So this should definitely be a part of your strategy. And the great thing is for those of you that take advantage of CWC On Demand, we have several hour long training sessions mm -hmm. with some other fantastic agents. So Craig has done sessions, other agents that we've worked with from Texas, from Florida, from all across the country on how they develop their referral partners. Really fantastic content. Last but not least, before we get into paid lead sources, leveraging your friends, your family, your personal network, leveraging your personal social media profiles. Yeah, look, absolutely. A lot of times I hear people say, well, I don't want to I don't want to settle my friends into my family. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> look, who do you want taking care of them when something goes wrong? Do you really want somebody, a direct carrier, you know, someone who has no concern for them whatsoever, or maybe even another captive agency in town handling that claim and dealing with all those issues. If that's the way you want to do it, that's fine. If you don't want to use social media, if you don't want to use your personal network, you can do that. And I, and I, and I understand that's your, that's your feeling about it, but you're leaving a lot of business on the table you know, this, this is just a fantastic way to drive more leads. Social media has been been huge for us for years uh, to drive more business. So, you know, if, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. But it's, it's a fantastic tool to drive business, no doubt about it. Yeah. And for your staff, for us, before we even bring somebody on, assuming they're not a remote team member from somewhere else in the country, before they can even start with us, they have to bring in a certain number of, of leads, of quote sheets, of their own friends, family, personal network that proves that they can prospect. And it's how we teach them the systems. Let's say I ask Craig, not ask, you know, require Craig to bring in 15 quote sheets, auto property and umbrella, 15 different customers. All we need, y'all, is like their name, dates of births, address, uh, year making model of cars right? Enough information to run reports and see if they qualify. That's how we teach them the systems. Mm -hmm. If they quote auto property umbrella 15, 20, 25 times in the first day or two, data entering it, that's how we teach them the systems. That's also how they get some of their first sales. But ongoing, ongoing, they're challenged with bringing in leads. They want more of what we're about to talk about, right? If your staff want more paid leads like direct mail, internet leads, live transfers, which we're about to talk about, I would encourage you to talk with your staff about generating their own leads from their friends, family, personal network, social media connections. And we, again, have several great live training sessions that are recorded on the platform on how we do that, how other team members across the country have done that as well. But encouraging your staff to bring in all these leads will help you afford what we're about to talk about, the paid leads and sources. But before we get into direct mail and Todd is going to share a bit more about that. We do have a couple questions. There are actually two of the same question on referral partners. Kelly and Becky both asked, what do you give them back in exchange for referrals? Now, if you're with Allstate, nothing, right? We can't do nothing, y'all. If you're with farmers or if you're independent or another carrier, your carrier might be a little bit more lax in terms of compliance with RESPA. But, you know, at the end of the day, what Craig said is all about the relationship. What is our value proposition to a referral partner? We will take top priority, whatever they need. I'm not going to make them wait hours, days, maybe even weeks to get a binder. No, same day covered, same day binding, fast, efficient, accurate, top priority. Whatever they need is getting done. One stop shop for all things insurance in terms of questions that they have, right? Whatever they need. Maybe their grandma got into an accident and she lives in another state and they're like, hey, this is what's going on with their claim with Geico. What, what should we do? Right. I want to be their one stop shop, one stop resource for all things insurance, making everything fast, efficient, same day coverage, same day binding. I'm never going to pester them for things like appraisals. They can't stand that. They just need a quote. Right. They need a quote or even a binder. I don't need an appraisal to write a policy. But so many agencies try to make uh, the mortgage people jump through hoops. Right. I need this. I need this. I need this just to make sure their quotes, not three dollars off for the year, right? No, easy, easy, fast. That's honestly what they're looking for, y'all. They're just trying to get paid. Do they care about your donuts or your calendars or your little closing gifts? Not really, especially if it's a mortgage lender or a realtor, they're gonna make thousands of dollars on this deal. Your donuts aren't gonna help. You just help them get to the closing table a lot quicker. That's our value proposition. But if you're outside of Allstate, you can do a lot of stuff, right? We, we just can't. You just got to be careful with RESPA. You can't, yes. you can't violate RESPA. And put yourself in a position where you have other problems. If you're not sure what RESPA is, go Google that and do some research on that. It's just, 
it, there's a lot of rules in place when you're, when you're working with people in the real estate business as to what you can and cannot do. And look, I, I'll be honest with you, years ago, we did a lot of things for them. We did direct mail, right? We would market to their book of business for them and be their bar- marketing resource. Um, we did closing, closing gifts, gifts, you know, where they, we'd have a, a, a gift that was supplied to them to give to their client at co- closing. We do all these things. And what you find a lot of times is those people, they may or may not even take advantage of it. Yeah. Once you start working with them and they see how quick you are and how responsive you are and how good you are to helping them getting deals done, sometimes other stuff doesn't really even matter. So I think the main thing in, in today's world is just to become friends. If you become friends with them, you know, and you work with them and they like you and they trust you and you help them get more deals done, that's the best way to build that relationship. Well, now we're going to transition to paid lead mm-hmm. sources. And we have a guy on this call that knows a thing or two <laughs> about direct mail. Am I pronouncing that right? Direct mail. Okay. I'm just kidding. Todd McLean, and I hope Todd doesn't mind, but I put together a little slide plug in his company, Perfect. smarketingmail.com. Brittany is his uh, operator. She's fantastic. We've been using Smarketing Mail mm-hmm. for years, but Todd, will you share some things about direct mail, things that agents should consider, whether they use your company or not, that will help sure. them be successful? Yeah, and you know, the, the only reason, you know, I, I'm not a, a serial entrepreneur on purpose. Um, I, I wanted, the reason why I started my own direct mail firm was because all the other direct mail companies that I was trying out, I, I kept getting low contact rate, bad ROI, and my common denominator came back to they're, they're not agents. Like they're, they're not, they're not live seeing the results. You know, they're just printing something for me. Right. So they don't know when there's mail fatigue, they don't know what, what ad copy works in certain regions and what doesn't. So it just drove me to a point of insanity where I knew I, I had to solve the problem myself. And so that's, that's where I, I, come in with agents and, and help them understand that direct mail isn't as simple as just, you know, we call it turnkey because we want to make it easy for the agent, but there's things on your end that you have to track and monitor you know, to make sure that you have a successful campaign. Um, just a couple of things, like number one, whenever an agent signs up with us, uh, our zip codes are exclusive. So uh, for the mail piece that we're sending out, so we need to make sure, you know, are those zip codes even available? I know with some changes coming up to a lot of carriers, our zip codes are getting snatched up pretty quick. So first we want to make sure though, are those zip codes where you're most competitive on home insurance? And a lot of agents, whether their carrier won't tell them that, or, you know, whether they're not trying to track it in the first place, if you're doing any kind of marketing, whether it's internet leads, any kind of marketing, you always want to focus your efforts where you're, com- you're competitive. And I find that that's probably one of the main things that I have to teach agents to start with is you need to start paying attention to what zip codes you're competitive in, right? And then the number two issue that we run into a lot is we help agents figure out what kind of teaser rates we're going to put onto that mail piece. And one of uh, the some issues that come up because of that teaser rate is we have scripts that we give to agents, but a lot of times the agents don't want a teaser rate. And what I mean by that is, you know, they'll get phone calls and they do the quote for the consumer and they start saying things like, well, you know, your, your price on the mail piece was, was too low. Like, um, so they don't know how to walk people into the quote from the teaser price. And so they call us back saying, hey, can you bump my teaser up to, you know, a couple hundred dollars more? And I'm like, and and they'll say, that's more realistic. That's like, that's more realistic in the market. And I'm like, more realistic for who? You, you, You told us that you had people that you quoted less. And well, it's like an average. Like nobody's gonna get enticed to call you from an average. So we have to, we have to really do a good job on our end training agents and their staff on how to accept that, that mail piece. You know, when that person calls in, how to convert them into a competitive conversation about their current carrier and away from a teaser rate that got them to call in the first place, right? So really transitioning scripts are, are critical. And then I would say another thing that's really, really, really important with direct mail, and you, you had mentioned this earlier, like making people earn the right to receive paid leads I can't tell you how many times we get calls from agents and the first thing they say is we just hired somebody and we're going to send these leads to them. (laughs) 
And guys, there's a reason why direct mail is expensive. People are calling you for a quote. It's an exclusive and they are, they're not just hot. They want you to tell them like, please give me a quote, right? And so if you don't have somebody who knows how to close, knows how to value sell, then it's incredibly hard to get a decent ROI with direct mail. And then the last thing that's super important with direct mail is volume. It is a true volume game because you'll have, yeah, for example, this year, 2021, I had an average contact rate of about 0.7%. And by the way, if anybody tells you that their contact rate is over 1%, they're lying to you out the teeth. Um, so on a 0.7% and our closing ratio was around 30%, it helped me hit bonus every month. So yeah, I have, I have a really good ROI with that variable bonus. But if you put a brand new person on it, even with a high contact rate, and they're getting you know sub 10% closing ratios, and you're not hitting variable bonus, like you're, you're setting yourself up for failure and to waste a lot of money in direct mail. Uh, so I mean, those are, and then monitoring, I, I, I know we'll get into some other types of paid leads, but I like to use other types of paid leads like internet leads, because they're, I mean, they're subsidized through my carrier, um, you know, and I get them for like four bucks a piece. And something like internet leads actually helps me learn my market faster of where I'm competitive against my, for, for cheap. And so I, and combining the two, a lot of people like to go heavy in one or the other, uh, but combining the two also helps me understand what my zip codes I should be focusing on and, and not. And so um, the other thing with direct mail, is, is definitely the mail fatigue that we keep running into. Like this year, I, I am spending a whole lot of money testing new mail pieces. And so that's something different than whenever I went to other mail companies is they would always like, hey, do you want uno, like one through 10, pick, pick the ad copy you want. And I'd say, okay, what works? And I got, oh, we don't know. Like they all work. Like that doesn't make any sense. Some ad copy works great in some regions and others don't, right? Um, and so I go out and I test ad copy, I test envelopes, what should be on the envelope, is it handwritten, is it an image of their house, like there's all sorts of different techniques that you can use. And if you don't dial that in, you're going to get a terrible contact rate, and then you're not going to have any success to begin with. So being, being aware of ad copy, mail fatigue, and uh, that conversion of, uh, is, is super important. I and agree. A last, couple last quick things. Last oh, thing, sorry. sorry. Uh, volume. Everybody always asks me how many mail pieces I should send. And what I've always found is the, the magic number is about 5,000 mail pieces a month per producer. That gives them anywhere around 40 to 50 inbound phone calls. And that's something that they can manage while also managing their existing pipeline of whatever lead sources, whatever else you have coming through the pipe. So I wanted to say that. Yeah, a couple of questions that I have. Are you trying to tie them around renewals or is it just kind of spray and pray the areas that you like? How do you time the deliveries? Good, good question. Um, as a standard, we always try to hit them 45 days before renewal. OK, uh, maybe 50. So we're trying to hit them right when they get their their uh, renewal letter. And technically, I say we mail it on 45, which means they get it around 40. So they've gotten their renewal notice and then they're getting a mail piece in the mail. Now something, if you're on a, uh, this is especially true for like ECP agents or an, an enhanced comp agents that are new and starting a new agency that, that get amazing new bonus commissions. We tell those agents for volume reasons that you should do bi biannual mail because you never know when somebody might've switched their auto midterm. Like they, they came up for renewal six months later and they were in an annual on their home most people switch both, right? We package sell, all of us agents package sell. So they usually cancel their home insurance midterm. And the problem with every single lead source that's out there is they all go off the mortgage X date of the, when the home purchase date was. So when I go out and I, I provide leads for agents, I'm downloading the X date, but it's not based on their actual insurance renewal date. It's based on the home purchase date, right? So we, we recommend if an agent has a, a high variable bonus plan that, and you need volume to really maximize that to do a biannual uh, to be able to send out more volume and, and pick up those people that have are probably not on the correct X date. 
Awesome. And one more quick tip for me, if there's, unless there's anything else Craig wants to add on direct mail, use different phone numbers mm -hmm. so you oh, can I track them, yeah. right? Put a different yeah. phone number on there from your VoIP provider. That way you can see how many calls came in. You can quickly find those recordings, most likely depending on how your VoIP setting is set. Uh, for us, we also do sometimes direct mail for just an individual producer. We want them to right. earn the direct mail. So yeah, we do sometimes just have general direct mail that's that's company-wide. We put a separate phone number on it that rings to all the salespeople. But if we got a producer that's really crushing it, and we say, hey, Beth, you keep writing 120 items a month or 80 items a month, or maybe one of your team members, 55, whatever, you keep doing that amount of production. I'm going to invest X amount in mailers just for you with your picture on it, your email address, your other separate phone number. You still want to get a separate phone number for them. Don't just use their individual number so you can track it. But that's a wonderful way to continue to feed top performers, reward top performers, and the different phone numbers. That was really, really important to mention. Yeah, and I, I can't stress the whole earned right enough when any, any type of paid leads or even referrals for that matter, you know, your people... Um, they need to earn the right to participate in those programs that cost more money or mm -hmm. just have much higher value. You know, business doesn't really care about your feelings, right? It's all, it's all about what's the, what's the best thing to do for everybody involved, the ROI. And if you're spending all this money on these lead sources, whatever they may be, you need to make sure that you have the right people working them. Now, someone asked a question about the cost. Todd, don't you still have a special price for members of CWC? It's Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So anybody who's with CWC, a member of CWC, gets a permanent two cents off our listed price. So um, the the price ranges, uh, if you go to smartgettingmail.com, we have tiered pricing. Um, and we also have to make sure that there's enough volume in your area, that there's enough zip codes available. So we'll, we'll go through like what the actual pricing is for CWC members um, when you give us a call. The best way to do it is there's two ways to reach out, either email Brittany uh, at Brittany at smartgettingmail.com or on our website, there's a little contact us form that you can fill in and give us an idea of what you're looking for. And then Brittany will reach out to you. Um, let's move on to a couple more paid lead sources. Todd, you briefly mentioned a bit about internet leads. We don't do a ton of internet leads here, but we have some amazing training on our platform from two of the top performing all state agencies in the country, two really fantastic guys. Uh, we have webinars that they've done teaching how they work leads. We have scripts on the platform that teach you and your staff how to work internet leads, timing of the follow-up on different internet lead sources. But any thoughts from you guys on internet leads? Yeah, I was just working with my protege. Uh, he's taking over my internet lead platform uh, that we have established. And so with internet leads, there's you, you either have to go hard mm -hmm. or or don't do it, mm -hmm. right? And, because if you use it to just drip it in, here's an example. Internet leads already have low intent as it is, right? You don't, you don't really know how they're sourced. You get a lot of people, maybe about 35 to 40%. I've seen some 50% need to get a refund, right? I didn't request that. I was playing a video game, whatever the case may be. It's just, it comes with the nature of an internet lead. But the other thing with internet leads is you really have got to make sure that you're targeting your zip codes properly. Because if if an internet lead, your, your competition is three or four other agents. In some cases, maybe 12, I don't know. Um, you don't know how many times that internet lead has been turned over, right? So you really wanna make sure if you're competing with people, you wanna know what zip codes you're the most likely to convert in. That's number one. So, and then once you figure that out, you crank it on. You make sure you have automation built in. So with ours, when that internet lead hits our lead management system, we send an instant text message that says I'm working on, essentially it says I'm working on your quote. Um, would you prefer this quote by text or email? So I'm not asking them anything complicated. I am really, what I'm just doing is qualifying the lead. Is this a real person that actually cares that I'm about to give them a quote? And I'm not asking them anything other than just replying text or email. So it's really simple for them to just reply text or email. And when I do that, I qualified that it's an actual person and they care. So that really helps me if I'm cranking up volume, it really helps me figure out the top, we have about a 25, 27% contact rate on that initial text. If I have a lot of volume coming in, 
I'm all, I'm, I'm really going to focus my time and effort and energy and actually doing the data work and the quote work on those top 25%. I'm, of course, I'm going to make an instant phone call. I'm going to double tap. If they don't answer then, they're probably on the phone with someone else. I'm going to give them a call back within the hour and then follow up consistently like you talked about with the, the uh, plan that you guys have and how to work internet leads, right? But then it's, it's all a matter of follow up. I cannot stress this enough. Most internet leads are going to have a claim, right? They're pissed off about their rates. They're probably getting surcharged. And most of the time they're stuck, right? And so what we found is about 55% of our internet leads that we get, even if I have a filter for no claims, right? Maybe I'm paying the top premium tier. About 55%, sometimes 60% of our internet leads have a claim in the last three years. And so I might not be able to win it today, but calling them back like uh, 30 days, 45 days before their next renewal, before they get their next renewal notice, uh, not, I'm sorry, I said before their next renewal, before the claim falls off. That's really important, right? Most people exdate those. You never exdate someone with a claim on file. You always follow up with them 30 days before the claim so you can future quote it 30 days out without the surcharge and you're going to kick the tar out of whoever it was that, that they currently have. And so with internet leads for me, it's a living, breathing pipeline of, I might not close you today, but I'm learning about all these consumers around me. I'm learning when to follow up with them. I'm buying data for cheap that I can follow up and close with later on. With internet leads, our average time to close on an internet lead is 18 months from receiving the lead. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if you look at most agents, those internet leads they're buying, you know, they might go into a dialer every once in a while, but, but it's just going into a random dialer to call back at some point in bulk, right? They're not properly pipelining a lead management system to follow up based on the underwriting competitive nature of every single household that they're purchasing. So when you do that, it, it's a game changer for ROI. Now, the problem that most agents face, though, whether it's with paid leads in general, is cash flowing it properly. With something like direct mail, you're not going to, like, you should not expect 100% ROI day one to keep cash flowing the system. You know, with internet leads, you should not expect to cash flow that. So you really have to be smart with who are the right producers working these leads. You know, with direct mail, you want a rock star. With internet leads, I throw my new protégés into there or I throw my new producers. It's a really great way to get volume, to listening to their skills, to hone their skills pretty fast. And it's a lot lower cost, customer acquisition cost in order to train them quickly, right? So there's, there's levels of the type of people that should be working these leads as well. I'll let y'all chime in. Yeah, real quick before I pass to Craig, Lanny just sent a text asking 18 months average close time on internet leads. Of course, you're closing some within a few days, some oh, yeah. within a few weeks, some three to four years out. But the more you nurture those leads, you might close 3% of leads in month one, another 2% in month two, maybe another 1% in month three. But over the course of three or four years, you might close 15 or 20% of leads you bought this month. Is that That's what you're right. trying to say? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Our average closing ratio in the first 30 days is about 2%, give or take, depends on our nature. Like if we're super competitive, it's gotten up to 5% before, which was nuts. Right. But we've taken rate, we're taking more rate. It's probably going to drop to one and a half. And so a lot of agents, you know, if you're only buying 10 leads a week, Not enough. you're just, you're, you're going to hate your life because you're never, you're, it's going to seem like you're never competitive and you're just wasting your time. That's why it requires a lot of volume and you have to be very efficient with your time when you're shoving that much volume down your throat, right? So using, using a calling platform that you can speed dial once you get to too many leads, making sure you're not doing, you know, I tell my people, it depends on, on your office and how efficient they are, but my people don't do a quote unless we've engaged with them. Definitely. Um, Correct. Right. So being really think of a, I always tell people to think of marketing like an assembly line in a, in a manufacturing plant. Like how can you make things more efficient to getting people on the phone and closing? That's what you should always be driving in your office. Yeah, I agree with that hundred percent. I think that's, and that's why you can't really like dabble in internet leads. It's mm -hmm. like direct mail. You either all in or you're not. We have a, a full course on the platform 
uh, John Pavley actually came here. He's an agent in Texas and built an agency from scratch to about $25 million solely on internet leads, but he's all in on it. And that's what he does. And, you know, so it's kind of like if you're going to try to mail, you know, 25 pieces of mail a month and expect some sort of return, it's not going to work. With internet leads, you got to do the same thing. You got to be all in on it. You got to train. It's got to be efficient. You got processes in place. So um, I, I would definitely recommend if you're going to do that to go all in and learn everything you can about it before you go waste a bunch of money. Uh, one last paid lead source. Then we're going to take a few minutes to explain our sales process really quickly. And then we're going to get to your questions. So feel free if you already have questions now to start loading up the Q&A. Q&A is better than chat for me, guys. So at the bottom of your Zoom that you're watching, if you can click on the Q&A button, feel free to submit questions. Let's talk about live transfers. Internet leads, you guys are having to make tons and tons of calls or your staff are having to make tons and tons of calls just to talk to somebody versus a live transfer you pick up the phone. Do you want to talk about live transfers? Yeah, I mean, we do a lot of live transfers. And, and, and again, it requires some coaching, some training, some role playing. And, and you really need to be all in on this as well. And you try to dabble with it and you don't develop relationships with vendors. And a lot of times the rep that you work with, they can help you a lot too, right? And make sure they're fine tuning everything to make sure you're getting the best lead possible. Um, but you got to spend some time training. When that, when that staff person, when that producer, when they get that call, they need to know what to say and how to say it to, to continue on. I had a conversation uh, with a member this morning that just started and, and um, they were only getting about one out of 10 to quote. They weren't even getting to the quote on any more than 10%. Mm. So there's a lot of work they got to do there and they're, and they're investing a lot of money. And these are all that when you get online and you see people saying, you know, well, this lead company is not any good or this lead company is not any good. This is a lot of times the reason why it's not necessarily the lead company it's all the things they've built in. Like Todd was talking about, you know, having that, that mindset that you've got to have an efficient assembly line when it comes to your marketing. That's got to happen. It's got to happen with your training as well. Otherwise, you're going to go out there, give people your credit card, expect things to come in, and all of a sudden, all this magic happens. And a lot of it's work. A lot of it is training, coaching, role-playing, making sure things are set up exactly like they should be so that you get the best return possible and you don't end up wasting a lot of money. Todd, do y'all do live transfers? We actually don't just because of the competitive nature in our market. I found yeah, that customer sense. acquisition cost is a lot lower on direct mail, which is funny um, than a live transfer. But I, I actually want to bring something up about internet leads that I forgot to mention um, mm -hmm. because I made, it, I made it sound like we don't touch a lead if we don't get any kind of contact from them. We actually do do one step and that's pull prior. So we'll go in and we'll put in their basic info to start a quote in our system. And that pulls up immediately their prior insurance so I can see the carrier they're with in claims. And that's where we stop. So if, no contact. I want to pull prior, though. Um, we do validate that it's an actual good phone number. Like, right? So if I call it and, the, um, you know, it's a disconnected number, we don't, we don't do that step. We just get a refund and delete the lead. But we do pull prior because we really want to know, do they have any prior claims? Um, so I wanted to bring that up because I made it sound like we don't we don't touch it at all. Yeah. Well, we've talked a lot about today about many different lead sources from free lead sources to pay lead sources. But what do you does your staff do? What do you do if you're working the leads and agency? Once you get them to agree to the quote, we want to spend a few minutes. And honestly, we could spend an hour on this, but we can't because we want to get to your Q&A. We want to spend a few minutes about talking about the CWC sales philosophy on leading with liability and how you and your staff can close more deals, regardless of the lead sources, in one call or in much fewer calls, right? So, um, you know, we got to have a sense of urgency. Yeah, look, I think, you know, when a lot of you guys on this call, you know, you're captive agents, right? You're not, you're not an independent that has 50 carriers to run things through and, and try to find a better rate. You got one shot, you got, you got one price. And for a lot of you, including us, you're going to be higher than a, a lot of people out there. Mm -hmm. Right. So if our objective is to just quote and quote and quote and hope that we can save somebody eight bucks a month on their car insurance, mm -hmm. we're going to get beat up a lot and our staff's going to get frustrated and it's going to get very expensive as we move forward. If we change our mindset where let's make sure that we lead with our you know, competitive advantage, what differentiates us from the competition, and that's our ability to give really good advice, give good recommendations, make sure they have the coverage they need. And at the end of that conversation, when we're higher, we have reasons to be higher. 
And then we have levers we can pull because if, if I start every conversation, every quote that's done in this building, we do 250, 500 on liability and an umbrella. Do we write that every single time? No, we write the umbrella about 60% of the time. So there's a lot of times that we don't write the umbrella. But what happens is we go through that conversation, we do 250, 500 in the umbrella. When we get to the end and we give the actual rate and it's higher than what they have now, we have lots of reasons to be higher. There's a reason why it's more expensive than what you're paying today. Whereas if we just quote them apples to apples or something really close and it's higher, we don't really have any reasons to be higher. It's really difficult to overcome that. And at the same time, when we're higher at the end of that conversation and we've quoted 250, 500 in an umbrella, now we have things that we can do. We can take the umbrella off. We can go from 250, 500 down to 100, 300. There's, there's levers that we can pull to continue to get in that deal. And like Joseph said, we could spend a whole hour on the sales process itself. What I would tell you is that you need to have a li leading with liability mindset. You need to lead with liability where you, when you compete against other carriers or other captive agents, wherever it may be, the vast majority of the time, people are sold policies just to get it as cheap as possible. So, you know, when, when, you're, when you're looking at the coverages and they, they own a home and they have three cars and two teenage drivers and they have 5,100 limits, 5,150 limits, right? I mean, they're like, they're basically like self-insuring. I mean, they have $50,000 in property damage and they have three teenage drivers. You know, and they're out there running around, basically have everything they own in the trunk of their car. If you can create a sense of urgency and educate them on why that's not what it needs to be and explain, hey, we're going to take care of this. We're going to fix this. Right. And it needs to be done now while your kids are out there riding around and have all this exposure. That's how you can start winning deals. That's how you can start winning people over. And if it is a little bit higher, it's a little bit higher. I mean, people pay where they see value. Most all of you have Starbucks in your town. If we drive by Starbucks, the line is out the drive through out into the street many times. People paying 10 bucks for a cup of coffee, right? And, and cell phones are the same way. You know, people, they spend money, they see value. Restaurants, hotels, whatever it may be. When, when, when you see people paying for value where they, you know, recognize the value, you've got to create that value with your product. And the way you do that, because we can't control the rate, right? We can't control the price. We can't control the discounts. What we can control is the coverage, the advice, the relationship, the recommendations, all those kind of things. And that's what we have to focus on. So if you follow our sales process, that's exactly how the people that are in this building, the ones we work with all over the country, that's how they have the success that they have. And you don't have to win 50% of the time. If you can just get one or two more households a day above and beyond what you're getting now, doing it based off of, a, you know, hoping your quote is lower, then you're going to win and everybody's going to win big. So I would highly recommend that you follow that philosophy. Let's differentiate ourselves from the competition. Let's, let's show why we're higher. And the reason why we're going to be higher is because we got a lot better coverage than what they have today. There's a full process that we can go through to show you exactly how you can have that conversation with somebody through our scripts and basically paint that customer into a corner. Where they don't really have a lot to argue about at the end. And in the meantime, you kind of throw their company and, or maybe their agent under the bus in a very professional way where they don't, don't just go back to their current carrier and have them raise their limits. They want to work with you. There's ways to do all that. You know, in the last 25 years, we've revised and revised and revised. And now we've got a pretty good system. You know, it's pretty easy to teach somebody, this is what you say, this is how you say it, and this is how you can overcome that issue where you're, you know, you're higher all the time. Because I would bet a lot of you, that's a, that's a constant struggle for you. And rates are going to continue to go up. Everybody sees what's going on with inflation right now. It's going to, it's going to go up. It's just where are you in that cycle? You know, if your company's first, it's, it's harder, right? If, if other companies do it before you, then maybe you create some shopping and gives you some opportunity. But this is what we have to do. We've got to lead a flyability. No question about it. Yeah. And before we jump to Q&A, because that was an amazing quick summary <laughs> of, of what we do. We literally have hours and hours of training on. Here's just a screenshot of some of the scripts that we have available on how to work all these various lead types that we've already been talking about today parts of our sales process, like lead with liability, the assumptive close, right? Let's talk about that for a minute. Assumptive close. I don't have the actual uh, script here, but your people cannot just be nice, polite quoting machines where they spit out a number. We got to ask for the business. We talked for a moment about yeah. the importance of actually closing deals. Look, so many times I listened to a call this morning from a, a newer staff member, one of our, one of our members and he did a great job, very personable. 
you know, a really, really good job throughout the call. But at the very end, his close was, I'm going to email this to you, right? So now he's going to take the, the, the corporate version of his conversation and send it over an email. And all that customer is going to do is going to go right to the bottom, look at the price, compare it to what they have now, basically forget about everything they just talked about. And if it's not lower, he's not going to get the deal. You've got to teach your people to do an assumptive close with everything. That could be obtaining information to do the quote itself. But at, at the very end, when you're closing the business, it has to be assumptive. It has to be assumptive. Create that sense of urgency. You know, Joseph, I'm so glad you came by. And I'm, I'm so glad we got a chance to talk. You're really not, lucky nothing's ever happened. Your wife's going to be so proud that you made this decision. Now, to get this started, like we talked about today, here's what I need. And you just go right into it. It's not, how's this sound? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Can I email it to you? Stop doing that. You, your team has to quit doing those kinds of things at the very end. Or worse, nothing. Here's the quote. And then they just like, wait. Silence. And there's just like silence at the end of the phone and nothing takes place. And then people wonder why the people are not productive. You have to be intentional with this. And here's the great thing about all these things we're talking about, guys, is none of this is really that complicated. The hardest part, frankly, is actually holding them accountable to what you teach them. The, the, the actual talk pass, the scripts, everything that we use, that we've proven for years, everything Todd uses, it's not complicated. The hard part is you as the owner having to go and hold them accountable to that. Maybe making them do some redemption calls where they call a customer back and do what they were supposed to do the first time. Maybe you do that over and over to teach them, look, we're, this is serious. You got to do this the right way. Okay. But the assumptive close is one of the most important parts of the process. And so many producers, so many you know, agents, people are not doing that. They're, they're so, I don't know if they're just scared of the rejection of what might happen, but they're so nonchalant at the very end. And that's why they don't get the deal. And then someone else works with them that does have an assumptive close and they get it. You know, a lot of the direct carriers, which we knock on all the time, they do a pretty good job closing. A lot of them, they learn how to overcome objections. They learn how to keep going. They learn how to get those digits, right? We've got to teach our people the same thing. So just in summary, before we get to y'all's Q&A, we would love to work with you. Allow me just one last time to remind you of this very special offer. For $20, check us out craigwilliamscoaching.com slash on demand promo code is 2022 success reach out to Brittany at smartmail.com check them out at smartmail.com we've been using them for years with great success with that said though i want to thank you all for attending tuesday and or today we've got time for about 20 minutes or so mm -hmm. of questions so feel free to submit your questions here uh, monica this is for todd when do you advise to put a lead on a renewal X date if you've not been able to make contact? By the way, I just joined agency MVP, exclamation mark. Awesome. Also, if they reply stop text, does that mean text only or all workflows? Are these also considered do not calls? That's a very agency MVP specific question, but also right. a great general question on when to follow up if we haven't made contact. So I, I think when you put a lead, um, on the only time I put a lead on the X date renewal follow-up calls, it, it really depends on, did I do everything I needed to do? Did I exhaust my attempts that I have planned out for that lead? And I know it's a good phone number, then I'll set it up on an X date, you know, 45 days out and follow up with them. Anytime somebody replies back, stop, that has to do with stopping any kind of texting. So you're not, TCPA rules are if you, if somebody replies stop, then you can no longer text them, but our email campaigns will continue because you're still allowed to email. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what the stop is and for all TCPA compliance is if you receive a stop message, you cannot text them anymore. Um, BT asked, how many prospects do you think one producer can effectively chase or work at a time? I, we, can, we can do something funny. I can give you a real number. Do it. Yeah. So uh, right now, one of my producers is chasing. So these are people that they quoted in the past. And the, the thing is, is my people only chase people that are most valuable, most likely to close. 2,251 prospects today. Is, so, that a, is that an MVP term, Chase? I, yeah. Okay. Uh, so out of those, 
they probably make 100 calls a day. That's their goal, right? Um, but they're only focusing on those top 100 because mm -hmm. it's impossible to call 2,200, right? But they've done 20, their pipeline has grown to the extent of having 2,200 people that they're supposed to call today. So that's, that's where the, the whole reason I developed that, that software is, is you only have so much time to chase somebody. So you might as well make it the most effect, effective as possible. And your algorithms are putting people up towards the top of their list who they should be calling based on when accidents are falling off, when renewals have been, other factors? Competitors, rates, underwriting elements um, with your carrier versus their current carrier. So it's, it's really just, you know, most likely to close, most valuable. Yeah. Higher premium, multi-line, that, that stuff too. Now, James is a newer agent. He says, what would you recommend purchasing for a new agent like myself? I'm imagining he means the different types of leads and quantities. I mean, myself, if I'm on, an, uh, it depends. If, if you're on an enhanced comp plan, then I'm blowing it up. I, I'm doing everything humanly possible and I'm engaging my team. I'm building my team. You have a very limited window to get to the top tiers of enhanced comp. Uh, and then you got to maximize that comp as fast as possible. I've seen some agents grow, you know, 10 million premium in one year because they're on an enhanced comp and they can afford all the marketing to do so. So I, I see a lot of agents who jump in though, and they're very timid about making that investment. They don't want to go into debt. Um, it just means you don't understand the opportunity in front of you, right? You don't, you don't, you got to leverage debt properly if you're on an enhanced comp plan to maximize its value. Yeah, the thing I would add to that is, you know, especially for newer agents, a lot of times they love to evaluate their ROI in that given month, right? And you got to think about so many other factors involved. You know, the, the average customer is going to stay with you for about 7.2 years. So even if you're losing money in years one and two, you're going to make it in three, four, five, six, and seven. So you've got all this future renewal income that's going to come in. Um, and, and not to mention the value of the book itself. You know, for those of you that have agencies where you have financial interest that you can sell. So, you know, think about scaling. Think about what do I need to do to get as big as I can get as fast as I can get there while you manage your cash flow. And look, one little tip that I kind of give you when it comes to managing your money that I use years and years ago, when you think about the value of that money and what it truly represents, you know, when you when you spend something on yourself, right? Let's say I'm going to go buy a boat, right? And I'm going to go buy a $40,000 boat. You know, for most people in, in, in the tax brackets that we have today, it would take me about 60, 70, maybe $80,000. I have to earn that much money to buy a $40,000 boat, right? So I'm having to really earn almost double whatever it is I'm spending. Where the flip side of that is when I invest $40,000 in my business, and I need to hire somebody. The government's helping me with that. At the end of the day, once I deduct that, I may only be paying 20, 25, maybe $30,000. So when, when you're looking at choices, especially, and I say this because the question came from a newer agent, a lot of times you really have trouble trying to figure out where do I put my money. Always look at it that way. If you're going to spend it on yourself, you're basically spending double what you're spending. If you're spending it on your business, you're spending like half what you're spending because you're getting help from the government. And if you make those kind of decisions you're consistent with, you learn from your mistakes, you know, over time, that's how you can help scale that agency. So I agree with Todd. If you've got an enhanced commission program as part of your contract, go all in, do everything you can, because that sand's running through the hourglass, right? That time's running out. But also just be mindful that regardless of which contract you're on, scaling that business sometimes is going to require you to pay a little bit more money right now than what you're actually bringing in to build those future renewals. And that's just part of this business. But the great part is the more and more that you do, the bigger and bigger it gets, you know, the more you have later on down the road. Um, Rhonda asked, she's with Allstate, are the mailings Allstate approved? So for us with Allstate, as long as you don't use Allstate's logo or branding or trademarks, you can use smarketingmail.com or other uh, mail vendors out there. You can build your own personal brand and uh, market yourself. That's if you're with Allstate. I'm curious, how does farmers treat their logo and stuff? Do they not want you to put your logo? Same yeah, way. Same way. So we always tell agents, you know, if you have your own logo, great. Um, most people don't care if there's a logo or not, right? Um, but we, yeah, we, we recommend that you definitely don't use the Allstate logo. No. 
Now, what about pictures? Maybe the picture of the team, a picture of the agency, something like that. Uh, we do, when we do direct mail for Beth, you know, because you guys do it, we put her picture on it, yep. right? It's her direct mail piece. So pictures might be good. It might make it seem very personable instead of just some logo that you made on 99designs.com. <laughs> right. My wife's photo is on mine. Right? <laughs> You're a smart man, dude. <laughs> so yeah, we always tell agents, like if, if, if you're like me and not the, the most handsome fella out there, uh, use team members, use, use your wife. Like it's the photo is they need to look friendly and not like they're going to, you know, beat you to death. Right. So, um, photos make a big deal. Uh, Kathy said, asked, so old internet leads purchased a year or more ago that were not worked correctly. She knows they weren't worked as well as they should have been. What steps to recontact them and how long before you think we get that percentage to close? So old stuff, maybe they bought, didn't work as well as they should. How do they rekindle those flames? So those, those I would throw into an X date plan. Uh, usually those leads have the renewal date from the prior carrier on them, like their expiration. Um, and so I would, I would organize those by date and call them on those X dates. And if they look one, any bad ones, toss them out. So you're not wasting time again, but then we, we would, we would pull, we would treat them like, like before, if I would pull prior, I wouldn't do a quote. I just pull prior. If it was a good contact information to see if there's a better underwriting time to follow up. And I might also text them if, if there's a good underwriting time to follow up at that time, right? So it's, it's really just strategy about how do I get better organized and working my pipeline so that I'm not doing this every 12 months with a new staff member because I wasn't monitoring and making sure that they were doing it effectively and efficiently before, right? So let's, let's not repeat that and have a year from now another list of old leads that were never worked properly. Good stuff. Guys, we have time for even more questions. I have one more lined up here, but if you have anything at all for Todd or for Craig, feel free to submit to the Q&A. Donnie, Donnie was with CWC for a while, left a few months ago. I'm wondering how often his course material is updated. I find myself wanting to get a, <clears throat> excuse me, to get a refresher on particular topics, but I'm also trying to balance with the cost. Would you want to address that? Yeah, we update every week. We do a brand new live training um, every single week. And look, a lot of this, a lot of this content that you see on the website, you know, it needs to be revisited anyway. So you need to go back through it. You know, it's it's sometimes it's it's kind of like watching a movie. You know, you go watch a movie and then you go watch it again and you pick up on something you didn't see the first time. And you also got to remember the, the nature of the content. Sometimes staff, you know, we we try to produce it in a way where they're learning from their peers. But even then, sometimes if if you're not holding them accountable to it. If you're not following up, if you're not reinforcing, sometimes I got to go through this thing multiple, multiple times. So um, feel free to reach out to us. We, we would love to work with you again. And, um, and maybe you set up a meeting with your team to kind of restart everything and refresh it and, and get started off on the right foot. Um, let's see here, Becky, which internet lead? Oh, this is always the question. Which providers, which internet lead <laughs> provider, which light pole transfer provider have you had the most success with? Todd, do you want to? Give give that answer. Yeah, I'm looking it up right now. I'll tell you. So right now on um, Quilt Wizard is is one of our main ones. We have a 23% contact rate. So that means they reply. Are these internet every, leads? Yep. Okay. So 23 first contact in in the first text and. Uh, Ever quotes the other one that I use. By the way, there's other ones like All Web Leads that I've tried. Um, what I found with All Web Leads is that they are regional based because they have their own insurance carrier in house that they don't like to talk about. So uh, there's there's a lot of other ones. There's like a one called Quote Hound. They have their own mega in house um, uh, insurance company in the background. So a lot of the times that these, these lead providers are trying to use agents to subsidize their costs to build their in, independent insurance agencies, you've got to be very careful from those. Because if you're a captive agent and you, you buy these leads from these carriers and you're in the same market that they are trying to you know, sell you the crap while they take the good stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you're just going to spin your wheels. Everquote in my region right now has a 15% initial contact rate, same script on both texts. So which one should I send a lot to? 
Yeah. So that's so what's really important. I saw that uh, Becky saying quote was there ever quote not good for us. I, I don't know what kind of tracking you were doing, if it's like closing or what or how long you're working these leads. But what I've found with internet leads, the most important factor, I don't care about closing ratio on internet leads, which is, sounds really funny. I care about contact rate. And the reason why I care about contact rate is because that tells me consumer intent. Hmm. Like they actually wanted to let me quote them because the way that these leads are aggregated really drives, are they even gonna let me quote them or not? And if you're getting into volume, you'll find that you have way less success if you're getting lower consumer intent leads, right? So, and then the follow-up is the critical where we're closing and making back our money in 18 months off the volume that we're producing. And that's what she said. They all work better as requotes in the future, which is fine. You're kind of buying your list. You're building your list. And you're a buying data. percent close rate in the first month is amazing. So guys, if you buy 100 leads this month and only write four of them, you're like, well, they suck. I'd be like, no, dude. Four out of 100 is a 4% close rate in the first month. And you're going to get another 2 to 3% next month and another 2 to 5% over the next six months, right? You're nurturing, if you're nurturing those leads, if you guys are buying leads and only calling them three or four times, mm -hmm. stop setting your money on fire, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Any thoughts? No, absolutely. I think that the follow-up, and that's why this, when you see the feedback you see online about different vendors, a lot of times it's, it's not necessarily the vendor, it's, it's the way those leads are worked internally mm -hmm. in that agency and the kind of follow up they have. So you got to keep that in mind for sure. Uh, Monica asks, do you allocate time daily for training your staff, videos, role playing, et cetera? You know, we do, right? We do because <laughs> that's what kind of what we do help 1500 agencies across the country do. But I'm curious, Todd, what does your training look like within your agency? Are you leading it or do you have team members leading training? So for me, um, I, I like to train on sales techniques, you know, how to close, going through the value proposition. Um, I love doing what I'm good at. What, I, what I'm not good at is I don't even know how to quote somebody in our new system, right? <laughs> so I'll have a team member training how to quote not home and auto, how to quote umbrella, specialty, all that good stuff. So I look at what am I really good at? What are my skills? And then I train on those things, your day-to-day -day operations. I usually have a team member who's my most tenured or expert person train and follow up in that. Them. We definitely believe in the power of training and development and role-playing. In fact, we spent a lot of time talking about that on Tuesday. Any points that you want to make on training? Yeah, look, I think you need to be intentional about it. You know, you're, your agency is probably the biggest asset that you have, or if it's not now, it will be one day. And the people that are in there are the most important part of that. And you have to be intentional and you have to be consistent with teaching them the skills they need to learn, to get better, to maximize your opportunity. So at a minimum, the way our program is designed, all of our videos are relatively short, three, four, five minutes long. They can watch two or three videos first thing in the morning take 15, 20 minutes and do that every single day on their own um, and, and do a lot of training over the course of a week without spending a lot of time. And then you can come back in as the owner or the manager and maybe meet with them once a week to work with things on, on something very specific to that individual or with the group. So that's, that's the way we set it up. And that's the way our most productive users, the people that are really benefiting from this the most, that's the way they do it. The key is being consistent with it and not being the flavor of the month or something you're going to try, but something you really implement and you make it a part of what you do. And over time, it's, it's amazing the results people see if they follow through, if they're consistent and they're getting follow-up, you know, and reinforcement from that owner on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Well, Todd, Craig, I think we're going to end a few minutes early, which is fine because we want to get these people back to work. They're working to build their teams, get ready for 2022. Hopefully they attended both of these sessions, Tuesday and Thursday. I guarantee they learned a ton. I want to thank you both for sharing your expertise. Uh, one more question came in. Amanda, can anyone share if they have day-to-day -day processes in training someone new in insurance, currently just taking it day by day? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We, look, we had a guy just start uh, a few months ago. He was a chef. His restaurant shut down because of the pandemic. When it opened back up, 
Nobody would come to work. So he changed industries and he went through our onboarding process, our training process. That first month, the first week, he wrote 22 items, 22 policies, and seven of them were umbrellas. So we have a very, you know, specific way to onboard somebody with a sense of urgency, you know, with checkpoints and things to make sure that they're doing what they need to do to be successful. And you got to have that. You can't just hire somebody, especially someone new to the business, and just throw them in the deep end of the pool and, and, and hope they can swim. You've got to be very structured, intentional about it. So we've got all that laid out on our platform. You send us an email, I'll, be, I'll send it to you. Whether you remember or not, I'll be glad to send it to you. The, that is the, the best way to get somebody started off on the right foot where they develop the habits and the patterns and the things that they need to do to be successful. Where people fail a lot of times is they don't set any of this stuff up. There's no standards, there's no expectations. They get them licensed and they just hope everything's going to work out. And they come in and six months later, they're wondering why they're failing. So we've got to do a really good job from the very beginning, getting them set up and, and up to speed quickly. And you can do that. It doesn't take 90 days to get somebody up to speed. A lot of times people will say that, you know, we've had them be very, very successful in the very first month. Um, and we have specific requirements in those first four weeks to make sure they're going to be a good fit to begin with. And we've had several people ask, how can I get these recordings? So I need to download this recording in a few hours once it processes. I'm going to get it added to our website. I'll send everybody the link either later tonight or first thing in the morning to where you can watch Tuesday's session and Thursday's session. Yes, Melissa, you guys are going to get both days. It'll all be there uh, for you to replay and watch. And we'll just keep it up uh, for several weeks. That way you have plenty of time to watch it. But again, I'm Joseph Puckett here with Craig Wiggins. We've been working together now for like 11 years, yeah. something like that. Can you believe that? A long time. Can you believe that? <laughs> I was just a little baby, y'all, when we started working together. But we have created some fantastic systems that are helping agencies all across the country. We'd love to help you. Todd McLean, thank you for giving us your time. One of the Appreciate fastest it. growing farmers agents in the country. And he has awesome systems and resources that can help you. Check out smartmarketingmail.com and agencymvp.com. Todd, any final thoughts from you? No, I would just, I mean, I think, yeah, the, the one thing that I would say is what I've noticed talking to thousands of agents is the difference between training your people, getting them onboarded right, and consistent accountability. It's easy for all of us to see the top 1% of agents versus the bottom 99. And I would say those things are the difference, right? It's just, it's just work. You got to do it. 100%. It goes right back to what we talked about on day one is you got to be a good leader, right? You got to be a good leader. You got to, you know, demand um, not necessarily perfection, but ongoing improvement from your team and have standards and expectations to make sure they're reaching their full potential. And you're shorting everybody when you don't have that type of mindset going forward. So Todd, thanks so much for being a part of this. You know, Todd Todd's a, is a great friend. He spoke at CWC events. He's been here and filmed content with us. A lot of his content's on the platform. Just a great guy and a great mind. I love to do this more often if, if you're up to it. I Absolutely. think that there's a lot of a lot of good that can be shared in these these types of webinars with everybody involved. We have so many people in this industry that are that are struggling. It's really tough. And sometimes just hearing a little bit of information sometimes can be confirm, confirmation of what's going on. But getting a few tips here and there can make a huge difference for you. So, so guys, thanks so much. Thanks to Joseph. He always does a great job moderating and, and adding value as well. But Todd, appreciate you being a part of this and um Hopefully we'll do it again soon, maybe after the first of the year, sometime next year. So Absolutely. thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate you guys being a part of what we're doing. Appreciate it.